We have a distinguished Methodist preacher with us today, uh, Tamara's dad, Wilson Strickhausen, and Anita are with us, and they're usually here the Sunday after uh, Christmas, and Wilson usually preaches, but they're going to be with their son in Germany this Christmas, so they were here for Thanksgiving with the family, so I told him he's just going to have to skip a year on our tradition and uh, crank up the sermon for the for the next year. I don't know whether Wilson's going to agree with what I'm about to say. Um, <laughs> I was over at, uh, at a lecture series over at Perkins School of Theology, our Methodist school, and uh, it was a preacher's uh, seminar, and one of the uh, professors who was presenting it, he said there was a phrase which he liked very much that he had heard recently, and I've actually heard it twice over at Perkins from professors over there where somebody said the opposite of uh, faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is, now don't say amen to this because I'm going to object to it, okay? So I don't want to get you on the other side and then knock you down. Said the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. And that that is not true. Now, the reason that would be... Oh, I lost my little red cap. The reason that would be current at, 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 at Perkins is that they, uh, uh, a lot of the professors are able to maintain a very high level of doubt. I'm saying a lot of them. That's not, that's not true. But, but some of them, some of them are. And I have, I, I was wondering this morning as I was thinking uh, about the scripture, which I'm about to read to you, I was wondering what it would be like to, to preach and not be certain about what I'm saying. I wondered what that would feel like. I know that a number of ministers have to do that. I think sometimes they are the ones who leave ministry. I have never had to do that. I have never had to preach under a circumstance where I question the reality of God or even the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And um, I, I don't know what it would be like to have to, to, have to do that. I'm, the scripture for, for today is actually the lectionary scripture uh, is, 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 is actually from um, the crucifixion bit in the Gospel of John where Jesus is uh, confronting Pilate or confronted by Pilate and uh, they have this exchange. Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus again and asked him, and this is an interesting question because it was one of the accusations that was leveled against Jesus because they thought this would carry the most power with people uh, calling, him, calling him a king. Now, the actual accusation against Jesus was that he was blasphemous, that he had called himself uh, the Son of God uh, and uh, that people had treated him as though he were. And in the Sanhedrin, they asked him that question. But in the uh, in this arena, which is the Roman authorities, and they were concerned about the the contest with somebody who was calling themselves king, were they going to start a revolution? So people had told him that Jesus called himself the king of the Jews. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, and this is, <laughs> uh, this is a funny time for Jesus to be playing with people, okay? Uh, uh, he asked him something that uh, was seemed deliberately designed uh, to uh, to provoke Pilate at least to think. Do you ask this on your own? Does this come from you, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, "I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests have handed you over to me." What have you done? Jesus answered. He doesn't deny being a king of something. Okay. Here's what he says. My kingdom is not of this world. 
meaning you don't need to worry about my kingdom. My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the authorities. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king, but here's what I say. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. And everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate asked him, What is truth? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What is truth? I think Jesus is saying that we can know the truth. We don't have to play like we know the truth. Pretend we know the truth. There's a big difference, I think, between playing like you know the truth and actually knowing the truth so that it's a comfort to you in your darkest times. So that you know that you're going to come through everything and anything. So that you know that God loves you. You don't have to guess about it. You know, you get up in the morning, you know that God loves you. And he's going to love you all the way through that day and through the night till you get up the next morning. And he'll love you the day after that. And God will never stop loving you. There's a difference in knowing that and not knowing that. You're going you're gonna to live differently. You're going to certainly feel differently while you're living. Doesn't mean you're never going to get discouraged, but it means you're going to... Sometimes we just... You know, I I think people just kind of pretend. I was in a a play in college. Actually, I was in several plays, but in in this play, I had a pretty good good part. Uh, uh, The play was called Beauty and the Beast. I know what you're thinking. (laughs) You're thinking I played the beast before he transformed. No. I didn't play beauty either. <laughs> I think I fit that. I played beauty's father. I was her daddy, a very fine daddy too. I raised a good girl, and uh, <laughs> uh, some really nice-looking guy made to look up look really ugly played the beast. And of course, there's that moment in the play where um, the beast says to beauty, still looking ugly, he does. He says to her. Will you marry me? And she says, yes. And in this production, at the time, she said, yes. Now, you know, we we didn't do Steven Spielberg special effects, but but there was some stage powder in a can, and something, a spark ignited it, and it was to go poof, and a loud noise and a poof of uh, smoke uh, at the time that she said yes. But now... Uh, this was a this was a cheap college production. We didn't have much money, so we saved the <laughs> we saved the powder for the for the final performance. And in rehearsal, uh, Doctor Black, every time the Beast said, uh, "Will you marry me?" and Beauty said, "Yes," it was a big moment. He would clap his hands and say, "Boom!" and they would <laughs> they would go on with the production. Okay. Now, we got to dress rehearsal time, and nobody told us that on that evening, uh, Dr. Black was not going to say boom and clap his hands. <laughs> they were going to <laughs> they put the powder out for the dress rehearsal, because we had, we had some paying customers there that night, and that's the night that some of the families came uh, to watch, but it was still kind of informal, and I could kind of wander around, even in my costume, and some of us were standing at the base of the stage watching that that last uh, act un- unfold, and uh, it got to the point where, big moment, the beast said, beauty, will you marry me? And she milked it for all she had, she said, yes. 
And at that moment, there was this huge bang, and uh, a smoke came up, and Beauty screamed and ran back <laughs> and fell off the stage. <laughs> Thank God her daddy caught her. I caught her just as she was coming down. Well, trooper that she was, she said, Thank you, Father. <laughs> and went on with the production, okay? We learned that evening there's a big difference between just pretending and living the reality. And uh, reality may be scary sometimes if we don't expect it, but that's where we need to live. We need to live in reality. The reality that Jesus presented to us is really true. It's, it's the real thing. I know we, we are accustomed to uh, some of our most intellectual people, some of our scientists, some of our people with advanced degrees, not all of them, believe me, dear friends, um, being smart doesn't make you an atheist, okay? Being stupid makes you an atheist. You can be real smart and still be very stupid about some things, uninformed, unrealistic. There are a lot of people who know a lot of things but really don't know what life is about. They don't know what really is real. There are scientists who are saying, if we keep looking, religion is going to become unnecessary because we're going to find out more. The truth of the matter is, and there are some scientists who know this, the more science looks, inevitably, the closer they will get to God. Because God is at the heart of all things. You know that, bush, that book I'm, I'm pushing now, uh, Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife by Eben Alexander. I'm pushing it just because we're going to have a study on it in the church in January. Um, one of the things that he discovers, and he says this is the, just as much a scientific statement as it is a religious statement, uh, love is the foundation of all things. That is scientifically true, that is religiously true. He said one thing that he learned during, during his near-death experience in which he was in a coma for seven days, he said he learned that, that what Einstein said about reality and what Jesus said about reality were essentially the same thing. They were talking about the same reality. And there are some things that I, that I know to be true. I've listed three of them under that sermon title, What is Truth? Things that I know for sure, and if I know it, anybody can know it. We don't have to be the brightest bulb on the tree to know this. We don't have to be Einstein to figure it out. And Einstein didn't figure it out as well as some other people have. God is real. Jesus really is Lord. You don't have to play like. You don't have to say, I'm going to church today and we're going to play like Jesus is king. No. He really is. He is at the heart of all things. God is real. Jesus is Lord. Life lasts forever. And all should be well. All should be well. That's a crazy idea, but that's the first thing even Alexander said when he came out of his coma. He said to us, he had, you know, he had met the grace and the power of God. Here's a spoiler alert. He had met a sister that had died before he ever met her. She had been his guide. He didn't know till he saw her picture later that that's who that beautiful young woman was. And he said, as he opened his eyes, after miraculously recovering, miraculously recovering, he was not expected to live, not expected even if he lived for a while to be anything more than a vegetable because the disease had eaten, the meningitis, had eaten the thinking part of his brain. He opened his eyes and the first thing he said was, 
all shall be well. Because then he knew. He had been told that he was loved, that he was precious, that he was, that he was loved infinitely. We had uh, some of my uh, Presbyterian <laughs> youth group <laughs> here last week. We had, we had several members of my Presbyterian youth group, and 10 years before that, I had worked with a Methodist youth group that, that Patricia... Uh, Evans, who was also here last week, had been a member of that. And I see those, I started to call them kids. Why do you call someone 56 years old kids? I don't know, except they'll always be kind of kids to me. Uh, best brother Roy was in that group. I see these people all the time. Okay, those, those two groups uh, become kind of a part of my life. Well, I had a lot of the Presbyterian kids here, a few of the Methodist kids here. The Methodist kids were 10 years before the others. Uh, and the, the one of the Presbyterian guys last week, Doug, said, uh, you never even told us about those that other group. That wasn't true. Remember, there's 10 years difference in them. When they were in high school, I took a lot of slides when I was working with kids. I tried to show that group slides from the previous youth group 10 years ago, the Methodist kids. They said, don't ever show us those old people. Don't ever show us those old people again. We don't want to see those old people. We want to see us. Okay. <laughs> I did tell them about them. They just didn't, they just didn't register. Uh, Ten years ago, one group was having its uh, 20th anniversary. The other was having its 30th anniversary at, at about the same time. Well, anyway, Doug was asking me last week, uh, are we in your book? Well, actually... Uh, a number of those Presbyterian kids uh, are in the book. The, the, the group is mentioned uh, in, in the book. Uh, one of them was a young woman named Pam who had uh, kind of played church. She had played youth group. She wasn't there as often as the rest of the kids. Wonderful young lady. But uh, she had played church all of her life until... This event happened in her life, and I'm going to read it to you, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask you how, after hearing this, if you believe it, if you accept it, could you question the reality of God? And if this happens to you, how could you question the reality of God? This happened some uh, 20 years ago. She had a friend who was killed in Austin on the night before Halloween. And some months after that, she was having to go to a conference down that way, and she was having to drive through Austin. She had been shattered by Jeff's death because he was murdered, brutally murdered. And she said, shortly after his death, and I'll read her, her account to you. I had an experience that will bring, that still brings me chills. I was traveling in my car through Austin to a conference, and unfortunately, I had to drive through the very area where Jeff had been murdered. My emotions overwhelmed me. I began sobbing uncontrollably, desperately crying out to God that I had always believed in but had never really sought to know. As I poured out my whole heart to him with all of my being, I was suddenly hushed and calmed. A wave of peace so unmistakably from God rushed through me and I felt the soft but firm touch of a hand on my shoulder. In my mind, although it was as if it came through my ears, I heard God say that Jeff was just fine. The comfort was unfathomable. Time seemed to stop. And the moment itself felt like eternity. And then it seemed as if Jeff himself was speaking to me. I suddenly understood that my life also is in God's hands. I was not in charge at all. My life is not my own. 
while I had lived all those years as though it were my life, it was not my life. I could no longer go on living as though my life belonged to me. I thank God for that miraculous moment. How incredible is God's mercy. How amazing is God's grace. Now if you ask Pam, what is truth? She's going to have to say, in that moment she discovered the biggest truth there is. Her life belongs to somebody who loves her infinitely and has final authority over her and is with her in every moment. And that is true for you and that is true for me. And that's got to be the biggest thing that we know. Our blessed Lord, let Pilate ask that question. And he was hauled off somewhere else. He had already answered it for Pilate. I have come to tell the world the truth. And if the truth we know and the life we live does not center on him, we don't know the truth, and we're not living the truth. No matter how close to the truth we get, we ain't going to be perfect. But if we live it, we're going to be a lot better and a lot happier. Join me in prayer. Dear gracious God, how extraordinary it is to think that we belong to you in such a way that you will never let us go. And when we are not feeling close, Lord, it is not you that has moved. We are the ones who have drifted. Lord, open your arms for us in this moment now and receive us again as we come to you and hold us and never let us go. In the name of our Lord we pray, amen. And amen.